day, everyone. Warm welcome to our esteemed panelists today. Joining me for LATAM Startups Conference 8.0. We have uh, Tadashi Takaoka, General Manager of Social Lab Chile. Liliana Reyes, CEO of Amex Camp, Mexico. And Luis Naro, Executive Director of PECAP Peru. So I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed panelists for a quick introduction. They're going to give a quick, maybe about a minute or two about themselves. And uh, we'll start with uh, Liliana. Hi, my name is Liliana Reyes. I'm the CEO of the Mexican Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. I used to work at the National Entrepreneurship Institute in Mexico. So happy to, to be here. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll go next to Tadashi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really, really happy to be with you today. Uh, I'm the head of, of, of Social Lab, a company that is a consultant company that now is, is changing into technology to combine two, two topics, corporate venturing, the open innovation with the startups, and social impact. It's really interesting how, how the social innovation is, is getting stronger and stronger in the world, but we still need a lot of, of, of muscle to do this. And, and we really believe that big companies can do that. So I'm really happy to talk about how this is changing the landscape of Latin America. Excellent. And last but not least, we have Luis. Well, hello everyone. And thank you, Latin Startups for the invitation. I am Luis Narro, Executive Director at TechUp. TechUp is the Peruvian Seed and Venture Capital Association. Our job is to foster venture capital activity in Peru, uh, and we do reports uh, that we that we publish in our website. We also have government conversations to to have public private initiatives going on in Peru, and we also have a, a, an annual event called the Peru Venture Capital Conference. So we're happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. So we're going to start uh, talking about the pandemic, which is such a big topic. It's something you just can't get away from. So. I would love to discuss that in basically the fact that we're in a transitional year now. So everyone's gone through a full year of being in the pandemic. And I would love to learn about the type of changes you've seen in your country with regards to adopting new technologies to continue working, communicating, and you know anything to really adapt and to change and what they've done to pivot. So I, I'll open it up to uh, Tadashi and then anyone can just jump in and just converse. Thank you. Well, it has been very, very hard to change that fast because having classes online on, on, on any platform is not a digital transformation. Like you do the same class, but on another channel. And, and it's hard to understand that. It's hard to understand that it's not the same to have the same meetings online. It's not the, the digital transformation to have the same class or, or anything else. So what we have seen in Chile is that on one side, the people with which is is, is uh, economically has better access to this school to this to these places to these jobs can ch change to this model but it still is not as efficient as it, as it was when it, they were in a physical place uh, and on the other hand the people that doesn't have the the access is still out there it's still uh, chile was on a lockdown we were a counter example for the world because we had a lot of vaccines i don't know if you knew this we, we were one of the two countries top in the world having vaccines, uh, Israel and Chile, and Chile committed the, the mistake to go out and we raise again all, all, the, all the contagious uh, part of the pandemic. And the, the thing is right now, the transformation to the, to the digital concept it is still lacking a strategy. It's still lacking a vision of how the, is human-centered. Um, and I think that's the hardest part in Latin America. It's not about having access to internet. It's about how you change the way you do things to, to have the connection and the fit with the new era. And that's the biggest challenge right now in Chile. My, my biggest uh, fear right now is that the gap that is between rich people and poor people is becoming bigger and we can't mm. stop that. Okay, okay. I, I, I maybe want to jump in with, with that comment that uh, it's actually had in the end. And I think the, the pandemic, yeah, like made it more clear that we live in a very uh, like inequitable continent. At least in Peru, we are in an election year currently. 
And what we see is like two opposite, opposite sides, one very left wing and one very right wing. And that's a kind of a reflection of, of people seeing that although the pandemic has brought some opportunities to, to develop like e-commerce, education and technology, FinTech, it has also uh, like made the, the bridge uh, high, uh, bigger between the rich and the poor. And those are the people that right now like looking for a change for radical like uh, changes mm -hmm. in like our legal systems and our, our like in, like general financial economic terms. So yeah, I think the, the pandemic has had like, it, it is like a coin of two sides, like on, on, a, on, on the positive side, like a lot of companies emerging and, and taking these opportunities to develop e-commerce, fintech, edtech. And on the, on the negative side, like making it more clear that we do have a, a, a very like big liability in the social and like uh, economical part, at least in, in, a, in a big part of our population. Okay. Well, I, I would like to add that from my perspective here in Mexico, of course, and everywhere, definitely there, there, there were uh, an important growth in the use of technology. And it's not just uh, the, the, the consumers in general. I mean, in Mexico, for example, the increase in e-commerce was amazing, around 80% of, of growth in, in, in this. Uh, for the first time, 16% of the population started to buy using e-commerce. This is good for, for the consumer, I think. Of course, there is a real challenge in the, the topics, uh, social topics that Luis and Tadashi mentioned before. But of course, this, there's a great opportunity, not just for the consumer, but also to SMEs that are starting to selling by this this uh, this metal, for example, uh, Mercado Libre has been increasing the the training for small companies that are started that that need to sell their products to the public, and this this was also amazing in that sense. So I see that there is great opportunity for everyone to use the technology for for the good, of course. Uh, I agree with Tadashi that education online was not the, the, the perfect way to do it. But there is an opportunity, not just in education, but also we are seeing that investors are looking for new companies or companies that have been working already in the um, healthcare, health tech, uh, food tech. There are a lot of sectors that are growing. I think that the, the ones that has been growing before, they are already doing. They are accelerating the, the speed and there will be many opportunities, a lot of challenges, of course, but I see this change very positive in that sense, not just for, again, the consumers, but also for SMEs that will have this channel to sell their products. And these companies like Mercado Libre are training more than I, I think they, they tell us during this week in our summit that we have, that around 80, 18,000 new companies started to sell uh, by, by using Mercado Libre and they are training them. So I expect uh, a, a great growth in this, this aspect. Um, uh, I, am, I am optimistic about this. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's amazing. And, you know, I'm going to pick up a point to what Tadashi was uh, mentioned about human centric. When we talk about human centric and technology, we always seem to disassociate the two. But one thing I really want to cover, and I noticed you covered in terms of gap before, was reaching the underserved uh, community. So maybe a community that they don't use regular banking measures. So someone that maybe received, when I was in Mexico several years ago with uh, Miriam, and we, we saw some amazing applications that reach those who don't use traditional banking methods. So maybe they accept money via telephone, um, you know, whether an app or texting. Um, do you see anything being able to advance within this tech, technological space that can help to reach the underserved a bit more? in terms of being able to communicate uh, to fill that gap. Yeah, well, uh, on an experience in, in, in social app, uh, we have a, a particular one where we were training people that 
were uh, making uh, basic labors like uh, building their own products or or, or, or stuff like that mm -hmm. and we started with a, a presidential course and then we needed to change because of the pandemic mostly women not connected mm -hmm. to internet and we we understood that changing them to to a platform an online platform won't be won't be the logical path because they don't know how to access they do have a lot of fear they don't have a computer a smartphone in the house to do that there are four or five persons in the house people in the house that doesn't have access so what we did we started to, to communicate through whatsapp and we started to give classes and teach certain parts on whatsapp which sounds very inefficient and in part it is but it changed the way that people could communicate, but it still had many challenges for that. And it's different from the way that you work every day. For example, when you are in a group in WhatsApp, you talk and somebody else is to start to talk something different because it's the way WhatsApp works. Mm -hmm. For that people is something that is very rude. It's not about ego, it's about self-esteem. It's about how they, how much amount of courage do they have to, uh, to the amount they need to, talk about something to, to express their emotions. And if something, someone else intervenes, that cuts everything. And, and they usually shut for the, for the rest of the session or, or, or when they access this, this process because they don't have any kind of help. Uh, they need to work in, 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 in their jobs, in home labors, when they do it. And usually it's when, when they're on the train, when they're on the bus and it's a particular place where you can always study so we needed to change a lot of the stuff of how to give access so the the biggest learning about this is you don't need another platform necessarily you don't need more technology you only mm -hmm. need to understand how these channels adapt to a different kind of of, of learning to a different kind of view of the world uh, different kinds of pains and jobs and, and that's what the, the biggest knowledge of this great awesome uh Anyone else? Anything to add to that? Well, maybe like not in, in education, but in, in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. We did see in Peru, like um, uh, unemployment is, on, is in like, uh, like a, a record place right now. So a lot of people that uh, had a job before the pandemic don't have a job anymore. A lot of companies that had to shut down, especially the, the SMEs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also to what Liliana mentioned before, like the the use of e-commerce platforms also like exploded here in Peru. Before the pandemic, we had 6 million uh, users from a 32 million population. And now uh, it is estimated to be around 12 million uh, people that, that are using e-commerce platforms, either to do groceries, uh, clothes, and a lot of stuff that, that before there was a lot of fear to, to use a, an e-commerce platform, right? So mm -hmm. I think, that like that also like needs now that the, the SMEs that had to to shut down in, during the pandemic start to to create like digital channels or start to to build their own like e-commerce platform to to able to to survive and, and and maybe to reopen again and start selling no so we've seen a lot of corporates working with with startups in this uh, level. One of them is uh, Banco de Crédito del Peru, so Peru's credit bank. Uh, they, they have a, an agreement with a company called Domingo, and they also have a CBC arm called Crealo, and they kind of work together with the Ministry of Production to support SMEs, uh, to support SMEs like developing such, such type of platforms. Uh, we also saw an investment from a Grupo Falabella from Chile, in a Peruvian startup called uh, Chasqui. Uh, it's a last mile delivery startup working a lot with logistics and e-commerce uh, stuff. So, so yeah, also like uh, corporates collaborating more in depth with, with startups in this e-commerce area that I think is, is one of the areas that has grown the most in, during, during the pandemic here in Peru. Amazing. Uh, Liliana, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I, I think that all these prob social problems that we are seeing and the acceleration of the use of technology, it's also an opportunity again for different VC funds to start investing in this kind of project with the social impact uh, in the center of their businesses. So there is uh, another trend that we, we saw during the, the last year 
and it is that the investors are looking for these kind of projects. So they are worried about how we can face those challenges, the inequality, the social problems, everything is it's in the center, I think, in the mind of the investors in order to decide uh, where they want to put their money. So this is good because although we know that the opportunity were there since, since many time ago, I mean, everyone knows that there is a, a huge opportunity for the growth of industries like the fintech, for example, in Mexico is, is the second uh, sector more, more invested in, in Mexico for, from the VC funds. So this, this sector has been already growing and right now it's, it's growing more. But there are other sectors that we mentioned before, and the, the, the opportunity is exactly the same size as the problem we have. And in our country, we already have those problems. So there is an opportunity for new VC funds or the existing one than what than than are rushing to to to, to include to include this kind of concept, this kind of methodology to make more impact investment to be aware uh, about the ESG factors, which is something that everyone talk about, but it's, it's just a real challenge to, to incorporate in your company, but also in, in, the, in the way the VC funds and, the, and even the investors are going to, to review and, uh, and to see that we are uh, achieving the goals we we put on, on this kind of, of project. So the other trend that I, that I think the pandemic uh, really put in the, in the table is ESG factors and impact investment. So from, from our association, for example, one of the key sectors or, or project that we want to launch this year is the creation. We already have a, a committee inside the association focused on ESG, including all the factors that we need to to have in our members in, in VC funds and in, in the private equity uh, industry in general uh, to help them to introduce these tools and to make the, the speed faster. So I think this is a, another good thing, uh, good thing from, from that pandemic bring us to put mm -hmm. in the center these, these topics. And, and I think it's a very good news to, to have this. Okay, amazing. And can you clarify ESG for the audience, just because they may not know what that is? Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's the environmental, social, and governance governance aspects that we have to follow in any of our investment and, and, and all of our activities that we, we have in funds or in companies. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. And this is a great segue into my next question is, Thinking post-pandemic uh, economy, what do you think about uh, technology and innovation contributing to the recovery of the economy? Um, I'm going to, maybe I can start back again with you, Liliana. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we already are seeing those, those sectors that are, are going to continue growing. And the, the challenge for, for Mexico and, and the startup in here in Mexico is to really take, take the, the opportunity and the, to, to start working on these big problems and big opportunities. Because it's not just the problem, but it's be able to, to transform this, this problem in an opportunity, to make it attractive for investors. This is something that is, is all, we will always have to be in our minds. Investor wants to invest in a better way, but they need returns. So we need to prove that this company, that this business model is, is ready and able to, to get uh, returns for this and, and they, that they are doing in, in the best way. So I think that the, the sectors are there. There are many challenges, for example, in the health, and health, health tech sector. I mean, the opportunity is huge in, in countries like us, uh, like ours, sorry. Uh, we have a, a, a big uh, sectors of the, the, society, the population that they don't have the, the correct and the right access to, to these services, but 
but it's not easy. It's a sector very complicated, even for, for investors to analyze, to really add value from, from, from managers and managers to this kind of, of companies. But they want the, the appetite for, for investing in this sector is, is amazing. And I, I think that there is the, the way to, in the future, we will be seeing many in investment here in Mexico and in the, in the Pacific Alliance. That is another aspect that we have to, to have in mind. I think mm -hmm. we are a, a, a very important region. We already uh, have 10 years in this Pacific Alliance uh, mechanism. Uh, this week, we, we have uh, our birthday number 10. And we already have many, many goals uh, achieved. For example, the, the creation of the Pacific Alliance VC Fund was mm -hmm. amazing. I had the opportunity to participate in that project. And right now we are seeing that many VC funds are investing in Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru. They know the opportunity and the, the, the kind of problems are very similar among our countries. So it is a, an excellent opportunity to escalate projects regionally. So we will see a lot of, of that in, in, in the future, in the very near future, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Tadashi, I'm going to ask you if you can jump in and expand a bit on that too, post-pandemic post yeah. economy. Yeah, of course. I, I, uh, I totally agree with Liliana. And also, I think that one of the few things that this pandemic has is that it's a social experiment, massive social experiment. So you have a lot of conclusions that uh, the years before will be impossible to try in a massive way, like working in the distance in a remote way or trying to educate people in, in the distance or, or, or trying to work with people in other countries. For example, here in our company, we're signing people from other places where they they we, we can sign them, but it's a process for us how to pay them, how to make the team building and, and all the challenges that we have. Um, and, and technology is always the, the first reason why countries grow. And that's something that we know from the 80s from and the MIT and the novel that maybe a lot of people knows that it explains 80 percent of the of the productivity of a country. So I think that the different topic of the of this post pandemic world is first uh, a questioning about the the, the economic model uh, about uh, I think we will move in, into a new capitalism uh, in terms of what do you do with money when you can't spend money? <laughs> you can't go out. It's a it's a social experiment that you can go out to eat. You can take vacations or luxury vacations. You can you can buy a, a, a bigger car, but I don't know why because you can't go out any, any anywhere. So that somehow changed the way that you see money. Uh, somehow changed the way that CEOs, because we work with CEOs of big companies, say how I'm going to make my investment. Because before this, uh, having a, a sustainability vision was something that was cool, nice. You were the nice guys of nice guy of the room. But right now it's like, it's the only way to enter the room. So, so that changed the way that we see technology, that changed the way that we, we make investment. Well, Liliana and Luis are expert in that, but mm -hmm. social impact is something that is becoming stronger and stronger and, and it's totally connected with technology because um, in the future, trying to understand, uh, it has, uh, already has been like that, but in the future, it's going to be harder to understand what is the main topic, the main social problem to tackle because it, it must be stronger the, the effort to to solve the topic of the of the new diseases or the people that is in poverty right now or mm. or or the people that doesn't have access to a home which social problem is more important and that's not an easy question to ask and in innovation and in technology the first part is to make the right question so i think technology data how we work with other countries how new exp we learn from new experience in a new world because nobody knows what's going on. Every, everyone is improvising, some better than others, but everyone is improvising. Uh, I think that's the real idea behind the technology in the new pandemic world. How can you, from data, understand how to make better social impact and how money becomes not a luxury, but a, a vehicle to change the world in a, in a world that is smaller because you don't need to travel to make a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, awesome. And I'm going to ask Louise to, to jump in on that part of the post-pandemic economy. Thank you so much, uh, Dadesha. Yeah, well, I, I agree with, with what has been said. Like maybe just to point out I, that I think there's no coming back from where we are. So I think mm -hmm. technology and innovation, we've, we, we are using it on, on a daily basis. And we've seen the benefits of, of having technological use in different sectors of, of the economy and in our daily lives. So I think uh, that's something that we are not, not going to go back like in, in to, to what we had before. No? The other thing is that for sure that like barriers are uh, like a, a lot lower. Like for example, having this panel like totally being from different places in the investor landscape, like there is a, a very particular thing that, that, that I really like that is that before uh, in countries like Peru that don't have like such a, a big supply of venture capital funds or angel investors, startups here tended to like to fly over to Santiago or to Mexico City and, and have meetings in person with the funds. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, since this is not happening, even if we were in Mexico City, so calls are happening like from anywhere in the world, right? So. It is much easier right now for startups to access to, to a, a wider network of, of investors. And I think uh, on the investor side, that has also put like something to at least think of in, in case like we get back totally to, to like on-person meetings and, 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 and this type of reunions now, because I think now investors are used to evaluating companies uh, through Zoom meetings or Meet meetings. They are used to running due diligence processes to invest in companies. So I think that's one of the, of the good sides of also on, on, on this, um, like this new context that we are living currently. No, and, and finally, I, I totally agree with Liliana and Tashi that uh, not only we have like the IDB or the IFC or the development banks of our, of our countries like deeply investing in venture capital or private equity, but we also have the private side that is adopting ESG practices that is looking now to, to have an impact uh, in addition to the economic returns that they have. So I think like, the, I, I think that the next years of like the startup and innovation ecosystem are going to have a lot of also like the responsible and inclusive uh, angle you know, in, in the investment. Okay. No, that, that's amazing. And, you know, I really love the points that you've brought up because from the visits that I've um, done through Startup Canada and with my community here in the region of Peel with Medium to Pacific Alliance, we've gone through uh, many stuff. So, you know, large entrepreneurship um, exhibits and, and opportunities to speak to entrepreneurs worldwide and now using, you know, basically the spinoff from the pandemic and doing everything virtually, there's an opportunity, as you all mentioned about uh, with investors and, and being able to work um, and do bilateral trade, bilateral um, opportunities. So you can have co-founders from different areas. So somebody from, say, Canada, you know, I've worked with Startup Chile before we did competitions and we talked about, you know, in Mexico and Peru and really having entrepreneurs, giving them the opportunities to really work together, grow from each other, learn and mentor each other. This now has opened up for an even bigger sense of social good. I won't even just focus on social justice, but um, the opportunity to serve everyone that's from every income level. And, you know, when we talk about technology and how do you say um, accessibility is, is a big thing. But then you just mentioned about investors and VCs. I would like to go into that conversation next. Um, you know, we talk about the roles of investors and, and that issue you talked about money and, you know, having it and what do you spend it on? Now, I think there's a way that uh, maybe investors and VCs can look at the spend a little differently because in the ROI, um, how, do, how do you think that the role of investors and VC uh, firms, you know, in your perspective countries, the respective countries, how do you think they're going to be able to support new startups and those already growing due to the pandemic and maybe even extending beyond your uh, respective countries? Um, you know, Louise, since you're the last person I started, maybe I'll start with you again and see if you can provide some insights to that. 
Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share some ideas. Like mm -hmm. uh, in, in the same line, like like the, the what I mentioned before of barriers being lower. I think both investors and entrepreneurs mm -hmm. are thinking like more more closely to this idea of of having like we are part of the Pacific Alliance or we are Latin America mm -hmm. instead of thinking like we are just like a Peruvian, Mexican or Chilean startup. So, so I think that definitely like has like consolidated during the pandemic because now we are all like communicating online. We have seen that uh, like a Peruvian startup, for example, here, Creana, they, their, their biggest market right now is Mexico and they grew like two times in, in, in between April and June of last year in, mm -hmm. like in, in their Mexican like operation. So I think uh, that has come to to like basically consolidate in in the minds of entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, the other thing that that might also like um, has come like to to stay is like this uh, responsible and and uh, like angle you know that I mentioned before because I think that uh, we've seen you know that technology has benefits. But probably technology is benefiting like the the regular people, you know, people that have access to a cell phone or to a computer or to the internet. And we've seen that there is a, a, a lot of people that don't have access to, to this technology and that it is also a, gr a great opportunity to, to develop services that can serve uh, those types of, of like part of the population that we have. Also, I think probably that startups that are going to tackle still financial inclusion or providing like technology so that people in rural areas or in the mountains or in the jungle or like in this like more like non-traditional places that have mm -hmm. access to education will probably also have um, a lot of, of support bro both from investors, corporates and, and other organizations that are, are also looking at this as a great opportunity. And finally, I think that uh, along with this is coming like uh, a more diverse uh, ecosystem. So I think diversity, equity, and inclusion is also one of the topics that is very like aligned to, to the ESG, but that that has also like a life for itself, you know, in, mm -hmm. like involving more women in both the startup and the investor level or having like non, like people that come from different backgrounds, not from the traditional Ivy League, uh, colleges that are participating in venture capital or, or, or running a company. I think that has also, this is, that, that's also one of the trends that I've seen has been like increasing during the pandemic. International funds trying to support uh, companies that are non, are like non traditionally run by the people or by the, the country itself where the company comes from. So diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion, I think it's also something that has come to stay. Okay, awesome. And I'm going to have Liliana jump in. I know, Liliana, you spoke about uh, VCs and investors before. So maybe if you can expand a bit more on that would be great. Yes. Well, I think the, the role of investors and VC will be key for, for the recovery of the economy. Um, they, are, they will be continue and they have been investing in the, the companies they, they, they were uh, helping to grow. So this is not just because of the pandemic, it's because the maturity of the ecosystem. So here in Mexico, we already have around 100 VC funds. Many of them, I think that one third of them have already raised their second or the third fund. So they are already experienced about this and they know uh, with more clarity where the, the key sectors in which they, they want to invest. So this is a result of that. Of course, we saw last year that the fundraising was not, uh, well, didn't grow uh, as we expected, of course. All these facilities of technology have helped to have this meeting with investors and everything. But it, in my point of view, it's not the best. I will love to, to return in the traditional way. Of course, the, the business travel will, 
will be reduced because we already proved that it's very efficient to have this kind of meeting. But the trust is, is key for this industry and the personal interaction is, is fundamental. So I, I see that in the future, we will have an hybrid model in which many people can participate in this kind of meeting, not needing to, to travel. But anyway, the, the, I'm dying to, 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 to have my, my summit in person. But of course, it was a, a great opportunity in our summit. For example, we have the participation of more than 170 uh, investors, which is amazing. It's a record because they had the facility to, to be there. But anyway, this kind of relations, of course, is, is trust. So I, I really believe that, that VC funds will continue investing in, in the companies they already know. Many of the interaction, new interactions will be online at the beginning. But of course, many of the entrepreneurs uh, and startup need to, to be close to their their future investors and this take time. So that's something that I'm, I'm seeing right now. And that's, that's mainly, of course, investors, uh, another challenge for VC funds is that they, 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 they can be able to, to raise money. I mean, there is a real challenge in, in the region. I'm very happy because Peru is going to launch the, their fund of funds uh, I think next month, no, Luis. Uh, this is good for the region yeah. because that that means that there will be money for new, uh, for first time funds, first time fund managers, and of course will be great for for the Peruvian Peruvian uh, ecosystem, and for the Mexican. Uh, this this interaction not just between a startup but also between BC fund is is working a lot. We, we see many Mexican funds looking for investment in Peru, in Chile, in Colombia. Uh, and we need to, to take advantage of, of, of the region, of the size of the population that the Pacific Alliance has. And in the case of Mexico, I think we are key in the sense of this, uh, well, in regarding this new sharing phenomenon, many companies are, try, are moving their, their production to places uh, near, the, the principal markets, I mean, Mexico has share, uh, well, or have a privileged uh, uh, geographical situation. And this can be used, uh, take advantage for many entrepreneurs that are coming to Mexico. In fact, this, this week, Endeavor launched a very interesting study about how many of the, of the companies that are doing or growing a lot here in Mexico, are, are founded by people from Chile, for, for, from people from Venezuela. And, and some of the reason is because here we have a huge market. They, they, can, they can pivot their projects to, to go to the North American market, including Canada, of course, and US, USA. I mean, mm -hmm. we, are, we, we are privileged in, in having a, a, a trade agreement which favor us a lot, but we also are part of the Pacific Alliance and we are the, the, the door to, to start in LATAM. So we need to, to take that opportunity and we see that this is happening, not just with the entrepreneurs, but also with busy firms. Awesome, thank you. And so I'm gonna end it off with Tadashi for that, uh, we talk about investors and, and VC funds. Yeah, well, I think that the biggest change is going to be how to evaluate uh, the projects, how you evaluate the startups, because it's kind of clear two mm -hmm. things that first of all, the, the, the social demand of solutions is going to grow. A lot of people is having a hard time now and it's not going to recover very quick. Uh, for the first time, and I don't remember, but something like 30, 40 years, people in the media class is falling to, to the lower class in terms of economic access. Uh, so the solutions and the startups are going to, are, are trying to solve that, it's going to grow, of course. On the other hand, people say, okay, we're in crisis, so less money for everyone. And it doesn't work like that. Uh, the thing is in, in crisis time, people with money generate more money. It's, it's so over, <laughs> but, but they, they, it's time to invest. They enter with, with, in a more aggressive way to, to try to, to understand the new solutions in the market. So of course, it's, it's not a good news for, for inequality, but it's good news for people 
and raising investment. Mm -hmm. and, and those two topics combined pro, uh, provoke another th thing that the way that you try to understand if something is investable, if something is going to grow in the future, is not only a financial decision right now, but it's also how the public reception is going to be. So trying to understand how the social impact works in a, in, and in, not in a moral way, in, 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 a, in a practical way in how you perform your investment uh, mm -hmm. is something that is new for everyone. Even, even though there are certain impact funds right now and it's something that is growing, it's growing, it's still a small part of all the VC market all, uh, out there. So I think that the biggest question is, how can I prove that my investment is working? Not only of, because it's not only selling and growing, but it's also it's changing the social concept that or the social challenge that he, he was trying to tackle. If I say that I can teach mm -hmm. kids in, on the on the primary school to make a better performance in university, how much time I'm, I am I am able to wait for that solution? Uh, can I wait? Can I tell an investor wait for me for ten years to prove that this is a social impact? Are some of them that are brave enough? And that's a new world of the disease, I think. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're going to, I think we have some more time, obviously. I'd like to touch base on a few more questions, but we were talking about our countries respectively. And, you know, when I think of, uh, I think of Latin, Latin, Latin America, and I think of the Caribbean and Mexico and really about the Pacific Alliance. And so in terms of your own uh, countries, what do you think or how do you think startups or existing companies that are looking to scale right now, how can they contribute positively to the economy in terms of like hospitality, tourism, just to, like to kickstart another part of the economy that that exists before we talked about maybe labor, um, like, you know, when you travel someone in a hotel, you need different staff members. So how do you think that is a way to do something like that, um, that she since we were here talking to you first? Yeah, it's it's a it's a big challenge, of course. But I think that mm -hmm. the way I will I will take this big problem is on the business model side. Like I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. what's your really value proposition. Like if I, I if I am a restaurant, and my mm -hmm. value proposition is not having only good meal, is is the place where I am, is the experience, is how can I make a luxury experience for a for a couple that is celebrating an anniversary or, or whatsoever. So. The idea behind this is, OK, I don't have the, the, the way to do that as I used to do in a physical place, but it, maybe I can still be selling what I sold before the pandemic, which is the experience. So maybe I can, I don't know, reinvent myself and sell a, a, a box that costs whatever it needs to cost to give the full uh, restaurant ex luxury restaurant experience in your house and if you're the husband you can buy the, the box and you can prepare everything on your house without experience and you can do everything like if you were in a restaurant so what i'm doing here with this example is trying to say okay maybe you can open your restaurant maybe you can work with tourism the same way that you did but you if you're expert enough or if you have the support of innovation experts you can mm -hmm. Uh, uh, recreate the experience you can recreate the value proposition that you had before with a different way of doing it with a different channel on, on, on whatever needs to change and uh, but that's a hard one it, it, it's easy to say mm -hmm. it's hard to prove and i think they're going to need a lot of support of the methodology usually startups and, 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 and entrepreneurs and, and people that work in tourism or or, or, or the food market or whatsoever uh, they usually are self-made people that made it with a lot of effort, but sometimes you also need metal. And I think this is the time for the metal. This is the time for the yeah. for the innovation in the business model. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Luis, I'm gonna ask you the same question and if you can contribute to that. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm not a uh, tourism or hospitality expert, but of course that is one of the of the sectors that was more impacted by, by COVID, no? So, mm -hmm. Here in Peru, we have uh, like Machu Picchu and all those places. And well, as Liliana was mentioning before, that she misses her 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 like in-person summit. I miss traveling a lot, so I hope that once this is over, we we are able to to get back and and like visit different places. And all. But 
But yeah, definitely. Like what what I do think is like true is that most of the companies that are in this space, like hospitality, tourism, uh, if they manage to survive COVID, mm -hmm. they are going to be like a really, really, really interesting case uh, post uh, this like crisis, not. Uh, because they will show that even with like this hard condition, they were able to survive, to grow. And uh, I think like to all of the, of the companies that are working on this space, like, yeah, uh, like apply what Tadashi was mentioning, like creativity and try to survive. Because if you do, like it is going to be like a very interesting case for investors and for other, for other stakeholders. In terms of like like your your first like part of the question, which was like how do like startups like scale or move? What we've seen is that uh, to to Liliana's point also that like Mexico is like the the first big market that Peruvian companies want to go to. Also, they might like open operations in Peru, work for for a year or so here, but immediately they they are thinking of Mexico because they want to capture like this. Uh, Spanish speaking and a uh, connected market to Colombia, to Chile, and no? all with the Pacific Alliance that we have. But what, what if we have also seen in this past uh, month is the, the US uh, Spanish speaking market. Also, no? a lot of like big funds like SoftBank uh, or other more regional funds like Alaya Capital here in Argentina are opening offices in Miami because mm -hmm. they realize now that the Spanish speaking population of the US is like very similar in cultural, social aspects to Latin America, of course. So that's also like a, a, an area that, that might be like very like promising in, in, in the next years in, ter in terms of how companies scale to, to countries like Mexico or to the US. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And Liliana. I think the tourist sector will recover very soon. I mean, all of us are dying for, for traveling and, and, and many people are doing, are doing it right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in Mexico, for example, there are people that rent a house for, for a month and they, they are doing uh, home office from these kind of, of, of houses and places. I mean, we, we have a lot of uh, attractiveness in, in that sector. Some investors are seeing that this is a sector that will be recovered very soon and they are interested in investing in. So my advice for, for a startup that want to take this, this opportunity is to collaborate with other, uh, other founders to include people with experience in big companies so we, we also see in the, the research I mentioned that Endeavor just launched that many of the foreign uh, in, uh, people that are creating companies here in Mexico, they, they have experience in big companies, big companies that know how to do this kind of project because it's not just a matter of having a good idea, it's, it's a matter of methodology, uh, Tadashi were, were saying, but also it's the capability to make, to, 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 to make grow this company. And that's the real challenge. So I really believe that the combination between other uh, people inside your team that can help you with this experience. And of course, if you have this combination of people from different countries that is happening here in Mexico, the most successful companies I mentioned, Kavak is, is one example, it's our first unicorn and the team is not from Mexico. They saw the opportunity here in Mexico. Corner Shop is another example. The founders are Chilean and, and a, a man from Switzerland. So they come here, Sweden, so, sorry. So they come here to Mexico because they know all of these attributes, the size of the market, the geographical situation, but also they have the experience of, of having working in big companies. Some of them, many of, the, of those successful entrepreneurs uh, are doing very well here in Mexico, used to work in Lineo, for example. This is the Lineo effect, and, and, I will see, I, and, and I would love to see the Mercado Libre effect because they know how to, to make uh, grow a company in, in, at, at that size. So I, I really believe to integrate new teams in your, in your company, 
different nationalities will be great because you can share the experience of different markets, but also integrate women. I think this is another yeah. challenge for, for the ecosystem. Uh, we already seen a data about this. I think fortunately from the BC side, in general, there are more women in the, in the group of, of founders in, in a startup, more than in the private equity. We, we have a, a big challenge there, but of course BC, I think is a, is a perfect place where you can introduce the, this, this kind of, of uh, inclusion, gender inclusion, and other kind of inclusion. So that we have to, to work on that. And my recommendation is that create a different uh, mix, a mixture of, of teams, try to, to see the, the advantages, advantages that you have of being part of the Pacific Alliance again, and coming to Mexico, look for those people that are already here and they know how, how to, to start dealing with the, the local market which is a challenge also. Mexico has many attributes, but a lot of, of, uh, uh, of problems that entrepreneurs need to, 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 to face. So another, this is my, my recommendation also, they, uh, go to the, the BC uh, associations in, in these countries. They, they know the, the key players of the ecosystem, not just BC funds, but, fund managers, they know the authorities at uh, the economic and financial sector, regulatory is, uh, needs. So it's a good idea to go with, uh, with, with us, with AMESCAP, the CAP, Gold Capital. They, they, they can help entrepreneurs to make this, this trip uh, less, less complicated. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I think the very last question that I would like to ask, and it's really sharing an example of everyone. Um, uh, I guess you could say a success story or a case study that um, a startup has, or a small company has um, contributed to, to the positive recovery or impending recovery of your country during the, the pandemic. So uh, let's see. Liliana, you're still on screen, so I'm going to start with you, if I can, please. Yeah, well, my example of, of success during the pandemic is Corner Shop. For us, we, we just gave them a, 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 an award during our summit this week because they have doing very well. They have grown a lot, but not just that. They have created many, many jobs during the pandemic. They have facilitated the life of people when they, they need to be uh, locked uh, in their houses, they, they provide uh, safety for everyone. So for, for me, this is a, the best example. And, and it's a combination that I mentioned, it's a, a, a very um, successful team and a very successful BC fund uh, that they are doing investing in, in other parts of the region. So for me, this is my successful story. Thank you so much. And Luis. Well, more than a company, I, I like to, to say like, like there is a successful sector probably mm -hmm. and, and it's for Peru EdTech because EdTech has the potential to have like a very strong impact on, on the life of people. And it, it, it has also shown to be like a, a great sector for investors. For Peru, we have close to $50 million invested during the year, during 2020. And uh, more than 24% more than of this has gone to, to, to EdTech. So I believe that that is uh, like one of the, of the positive things that we, that we see that companies like Creana or Prendea or Crack the Code are developing like in, in interesting solutions that impact the life of people, but are also great opportunities for investors. And not only investors in Peru, but also investors worldwide. For example, the one uh, Creana has now the, is backed now by Life Ventures, the IFC, Salesforce Ventures, Dila Capital. So there are a lot of, of funds that are like, uh, like taking a bet on these companies. And we are happy that this is a sector that has like an impact also on, on society. So ethic for us. Wonderful, thank you. And Tadashi, I can Yeah, I, I would like to mention something that is called Ora Facil, which the translation will be easy hour. 
that is a startup here in Chile that uh, used data to to help people to coordinate all the all the as uh, when they need to assist physically to to make certain uh, processes of or, or certain uh, topics in a company they need to I don't know recover a paper or something. Uh, in, in terms, I don't have to queue. Uh, they 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 use technology to make you going there when you have your appointment and only then. And it sounds really easy, but it's not a lot. I have seen that idea a lot of times during my lifetime in entrepreneurship. Uh, but these were the, the first guys that made it in a, in a in a really massive way. So during 2020, they helped 2.5 million people not to assist to a physical place or assist in a moment that nobody else was there. Um, they helped a lot to contain the COVID uh, situation. So I think it was a very interesting how, because of two of two things. First of all, it was very interesting because of the the social impact of of, of not of saving people of, of of being in contagious places, but also uh, how a solution that sounds really easy, which is not, uh, because you need a lot, a lot of coordination, a lot of technology, a lot of data. How hard it is to build a startup? With, a, with an easy idea, even if, when the idea is very clear, it's very hard to control, to create something like that. Wonderful, thank Meloni, you. Meloni, if, yeah. if you allow me to correct myself, I said 24%, it's 40% of the investment 40%. in 2020 that went to Etsic. Ah, okay, wonderful, thank you. So thank you all so much. I think we're running out of time, but um, there's so much more I wanna ask you. Um, hopefully <laughs> we can meet in person um, for the next LATAM conference. And uh, as um, you know, you can talk to Miriam, we usually travel in packs together. So <laughs> we've been to so many places together and for her conferences, and it would be a pleasure to meet you all in person the next time. So I just want to say thank you so much, Liliana Reyes, uh, CEO of MX Club uh, in Mexico. Uh, Tadashi Takaoka, uh, General Manager for Social Lab Chile, and Luis Nato, Executive Director, PECA, Peru. And I'm Melanie Campbell. I am a Director um, of uh, Startup Peel Community and also a board member of Startup Canada, Canada's entrepreneurship ecosystem um, wheelhouse. So thank you all. <laughs>